Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, welcome to the Terminos Academy, and also to the Royal Asiatic Society. Um, this is an occasion I always look forward to keenly. Um, it's become um, an, an annual event that um, Jeremy comes to give us one of his um, stimulating, exciting, wholly original lectures. Um, and tonight I think it's particularly thrilling. I've, I've been hoping for many years to hear Jeremy speak about Ted Hughes. Um, Jeremy himself is, is certainly Britain's most, most prolific <coughs> and original and risk-taking <coughs> poet. Um, and it's going to be wonderful to hear him exploring the work of... Um, another wholly individual, deeply <laughs> risk-taking, um, massively creative poet, um, Ted Hughes. And um, since today is November the 5th, um, we're certainly going to be in for the burst of fireworks. <laughs> and um, Jeremy will undoubtedly provide them. So it's a great delight to introduce Jeremy Thank Reed, who so is going to speak on law, Anna. power... And Ted Hughes and the Archetypal Underworld. Thank you, and I'd like to have you introduce me. Thank you. So <laughs> Thank you. As you know, I don't give any introductions. Raw power. It's unlikely that on February the 7th, 1973, bluely snowed in a court green, his roomy, ancient manor house in North Taunton, Devon, that any remotest leak would have reached Ted Hughes at the release on that day of raw power by Iggy and the Stooges, a proto-punk album of garage aggro with David Bowie credited as its producer, the two having met the previous year at the celebrity nightclub Maxis, Kansas City in New York City. The incongruity of the two artists isn't, however, gratuitous, and that Hughes's savagely ferile persona Crow, arguably the most brutally realised avenger in British poetry, incorporates a mythic ferocity every bit the propulsive equivalent of Iggy's three-chord, corrosively paint-stripping search and destroy. Published three years before the release of Raw Power, Hughes's book-length sequence belongs to the same turbulent generational mix of cultural upheaval surrounding the late 60s transitioning into the politically rebarbative 70s. And is the opening stanza of Iggy's Search and Destroy so very different in its declarative mission to unconditionally annihilate than Hughes's declared war on theogony in the chiliastic arena of Crow. I quote Iggy, I'm a street-walking chica with a heart full of napalm. I'm a runaway son of the nuclear A-bomb. I'm the world's forgotten boy, the one who searches and destroys. By any measure of pop lyrics, Iggy's menacingly paranoid protagonist with a heart full of napalm explodes musically into a world threatened to this moment by nuclear meltdown in a way that is both surreal and quasi-real. In notes for a little play from Crow, Hughes depicts the same atrocity of potential end times as two survivors engaged in an agonised ritual performed under a giant red sun coming closer. Quote from Ted... Mutations at home in the nuclear glare, horrors, hairy and slobbery, glossy and raw. They sniff towards each other in the emptiness. They fasten together. They seem to be eating each other, eating each other. Hughes's stylistic experiment in mythic narrative that drives Crow saw him stripping the richly metaphoric language of his earlier poetry down to the components of raw 
existential ontology in which no form of mediating intervention interrupts the maniacal ferocity of primal chaos. Crow was written between 1966 to 69 on the back of Hughes's personal shattering with the suicides of both his wife Sylvia Plath in February 1963, followed in March 1969 by his then partner Asia Wevel killing herself and their four-year-old daughter Shura. Both suicides were by gas resulting in carbon monoxide poisoning, with Plath insulating the kitchen with towels to protect her children who were sleeping upstairs, and Wevel, almost as a copy of Plath's death six years earlier, sealing the kitchen door and window, then dissolving 35 Sonomil sleeping tablets in a glass of water, chased down with whiskey, and then turning on the Mayflower cooker. It's of note, too, in terms of impacting shock, shock, that Hughes wasn't the initial discoverer of either body, with Plath found by her appointed nurse, Myra Morris, with the help of a workman, Charles Langbridge, who broke the door down, and Wevel by the family's au pair, Els Ludwig, who found the two lying together on a mattress in the kitchen in their Clapham, South London flat. The crow is sealed by an almost vanta black mood of desperate revolt in the unaccommodated universe is understandable given Hughes's inevitable immersion in guilt and unquestionable dumb tragedy at the time of writing. Unable to alter or repair the past, Hughes unleashed crow as an ambivalent affirmer destroyer with a mythic trickster's dynamic to incite controversy by epic lawlessness. Or do we, in reading Crow, personalise Hughes' protagonist into a black embodiment of his own psyche at the time of writing? We tend to read the poet, mm, and not the person. The ruin of someone half-drunk, facing their own darkest corners in a cold kitchen, writing to try and make sense of unaccountable history gone wrong, and drinking more to try desperately to get above it. Desperately to get above it. What the public read is a book rather than its making. It's wonky case history. What does Iggy say in Search and Destroy? Soul radiation in the dead of night, love in the middle of a firefight. Lines that could be used as a definition of writing a poem out of disturbing, colliding emotional conflicts. If Crow was seen as a radical departure from Hughes's earlier work, in which his viewpoint is nature observing man rather than man sentimentalizing nature, then his romantic muscle as animistic shaman was the celebrated antithesis to Philip Larkin's ball-shriveling poetic impotence of two acerbic poems a year to validate the typically careerist poet. <clears throat> Hughes was by contrast the indomitably inspired visionary of a type conditioned to create and by comparison, making Larkin appear inherently pedestrian. If Crow reads like a radical departure to Hughes's readers with his disarranged forms and aggravated diction, then his first three collections, The Hawk in the Rain, Lupercal <coughs> and Rattlings, reset the tone of British poetry with inimitably devastating crunch. The forcibly authoritative voice, so in command of its subject it seemed like he was it. The stomp of a Hughes poem permits no counter-argument. The focus is unflinchingly exact. The osmotic resignation to existential tragedy so acute 
the descriptive qualities at work so image-based they fume with visual intensity that Hughes immerses you in a poem like it's the last thing you'll ever read on earth. And that's how poems should be written, like they belong to the compressed space of your final hour as a prolonged adrenaline surge. Hughes's poems push out expansively into a universe in which there is no answers, only random galactic radio noise that originates outside the Earth's atmosphere as possibly the unsettled aftershock of the Big Bang. I'm writing this in the living room in Green's Court, Soho, perhaps the smallest cafe in London, a great reckoning in a small room, as Shakespeare referred to Marlowe's homicide, a murder he may well have helped instigate. I'm there to write and buy the street drugs I live on, benzodiazepines. Hughes shows up in the waiting like a giant. During their sojourn in rural Cashel Island in the late 60s, with Hughes booting up the ferocity of Crow, Asya observing from her first floor window the shed in which he wrote, expected quote, the hut to smoke with the temperature of his presence in it, the temperature of his presence in it. It's Hughes's mining of psychic depths, the archetypal unfolding into its physical counterparts that places him into the heroic position of underworld voyager. In the poem Thrushes, the birds instinctually polarised eye lasered to kill is counterposed against preoccupied human obsession. The thin divide between craft and madness collapsed into realised psychosis. I quote Ted, though he bends to be blent in the prayer, how loud and above what furious spaces of fire do the distracting devils orgy and hosanna under what wilderness of black, silent waters weep. It's my belief you can't write poetry without encountering madness. Breakdowns are essentially built into the psychological type. If you go down, you can't come up. It's like the tube. Asya Wevel, in living with Hughes temporarily at Sylvia Plath's Fitzroy Road flat, in the months after Blast's suicide, has left us perhaps the only detailed account we have of Hughes's working methods by an eyewitness. As he describes how Hughes would sit sideways, cross-legged, against Blast's black desk that was too small for him, with a sandwich in one hand and a pen in the other. According to her, quote, his nostrils flared, his hair feathery and leaping forward like a peacock's back train in reverse, swaying a little as he writes, rather like a great beast looking over an enormous feast, dazzled and confused by the variety. She goes on to tell us of his absolute concentration, his immunity to noise and that, quote, he's almost incapable of performing one wrong word. She also divulges his refusal to share his work with her and his glowering, solid black moods that often accompanied his writing process. It was Asia rather than Plath noted Hughes' reliance on channeling, state-altering inspiration as his shaping resource of heightened reality in which there is a perfect cooperation of right and left brain hemispheres in establishing a momentary solidarity with existence into which the poem fits. And while there's an arguable neural messaging between left and right brain hemispheres, the right side conditioning imaginative creativity and the left language and analytic methodology, the messenger infusing the two into a simultaneous response 
or the expanded awareness we call poetry is perhaps uncommon and given to very few. It seems to be the difference between imaginative poetry and its opposite reportage, which forms 80% of poetry, the efficiency and speed involved in imaginative perception leads to the sort of direct dissolve into metaphor or image that is only partly received by poets lacking in deep subjectivity. The one realises the inexhaustible possibilities of being, the other simply relates objective reality as a sharing experience, Larkin's trash. And it wasn't only the urgent, overpowering call to create that Asya noted, but the spectator's involvement in the limits imposed on her by Hughes's ruthless devotion to work. Quote Asya, what insanity, what methodically crazy compulsion drove me to this nightmare maze of miserable, censorious, middle-aged furies with him and Sylvia, my predecessor, between our heads every night. And does Asia's self-realised poetic prose in expressing the turbulence of her relationship with Hughes fall short of plus? I would argue in many cases it is far superior. It's arguable in Hughes's mythology she became the sacrificial victim to his ritualised call. In Iggy's title song, Raw Power, he sings, Look in the eyes of a savage girl, fall deep in love in the underworld, raw power is sure to come running to you. And the retribution came back on Hughes like a gun exploded in his brain. And what's amazing about poetry is its unimpeachable survival in the individual, its resistance to being pathologized or having its autonomous resource infected or disabled by personal crisis, but instead often feeding on personal tragedy as regenerative subjects. It's the paradigm Hughes instructs through the indestructible resilience of his trickster crow, which converts obstacle into questionable gain. In the same way Hughes survived catastrophic atrocities in his private life through the continuity of writing as navigable exorcism. The poem takes you to a different place from where it started and you learn why along the way. And if you believe like me the future is already complete and we arrive at what has already happened, then the suicides in Hughes's life were occurrences intended to be rediscovered as integral to his destiny. His poetic exploration of the underworld. Nothing is randomised to me. What we've already done is what we experience now as Taurus back from the future. And in Hughes's unforgettable last stand at a Peabrock, something of the inexplicable, unredemptive nature of our involvement with the universe is expressed in the aching emptiness of the galaxies. Quoting Ted, minute after minute, aeon after aeon, nothing lets up or develops, and this is neither a bad variant nor a tryout. This is where the staring angels go through. This is where all the stars bow down. This is where all the stars bow down. You can argue, what does a skinny, heroin-addicted, proto-punk pop star have to do with a serious poet like Ted Hughes and that only I would link the two together? To me, there's every reason for the analogy. In that literature, with its prestigious academic validation, takes itself far too seriously, to the point of being a retrovirus, whereas the notational aggro of Iggy's raw power collapses boundaries between emotion and language 
perhaps closer in outrage to say how Asia may have felt about Hughes or Hughes Asia or Plath about both. Iggy's I need somebody of raw power carries the same mixed mess of human relations with a volatility that smacks. Well, I am your crazy driver. Honey, I'm sure to steer you wrong. I am dying in a story. I'm only living to sing this song. And after Plath's revengeful suicide, in part precipitated by the separation Hughes demanded, he too was only living to sing his song in a distraught domestic arena with Asia, the green-eyed feral beauty with classical elegance for whom he'd left Plath and was now the target of a rage directed more at himself but turned on her as the target. A year after Plath's death, Asia wrote to Hughes, I am convinced you have maimed my life. You left me with nothing to salvage. The only revenge I can take on you is to go to bed with any attractive man who asks me to hurt your sensations out of my body, if not out of my mind or blood. Asia was responding to Hughes's serial sex addiction. addiction. His notorious voracious licentiousness, permitting no breaks on his sexual appetite. Hughes entered relationships, notably with Brenda Hedden, with the same creative, destructive agencies of nature that he so fully assimilated in his poetry. It's almost impossible to live with a totally committed poet without the partner fielding feeling excluded and secondary to constant inner preoccupations that take precedence almost every other aspect of shared life. The absence of parallel processing, unless the partner has a strong sense of purposeful self-identity, is inevitably corrosive, and Hughes, with his refusal to cook or engage in basic domesticities was at best difficult and at worst impossible. I'm making this assessment with no right to judge. It's no more than a considered evaluation of what others claim to have experienced. Hughes's third collection, Recklings, published in January 1967 by Turret Books. The poems written at a low point in his life after Plath's suicide, is a much undervalued book that tends to go ignored and was never reprinted in his lifetime. As a book concerned with the exposition of personal sadness, Hughes called it a collection of bits and pieces which didn't seem to me to fit into what woe. But it's much more than that. Its assemblage of variables, perhaps dismissed by its author at the time on account of his despondent, unsettled, desperate mood and his argument with existence. There are outstanding successes in Recklings like Plum Blossom, Stealing Trout on a May Morning and The Lake and emerging throughout the beginnings of what was to become Crows and Hughes's recreation of the universe as a warring, malevolent pitch. In Plum Blossom, he compounds aspects of the continuing folk epic that was to dominate his writing for the rest of his life in terms of the primarily unredemptive, quote, inside the head of a cat, under the bones, the brains, the blood tissue, bone of the bone and brain of the brain, blood of the blood and tissue of the tissue is God's head with eyes open and under that my own head with wide eyes and under that the head of a bloody cat with eyes smiling and closed. Certainly no other British poet of Hughes's generation could touch the expansive courage of his conical vision travelling like a spacecraft through the unmapped dark of inner space. The lake from the same collection is as near perfect an imaginative realisation of animated nature as Hughes ever achieved with its 
armadillo skin surface, aware of itself, alive, alive. And that humans, even a studied reflection, mean trespass in its own department of consciousness. The lake's indomitable push, push, push towards its own constricted escape is observed by Hughes as a conflict of demented opposing energies. Quote, yet how the outlet fears it, dragging it out, black and yellow, a maniacal eel, battering it to death with sticks and stones, sticks and stones. Hughes's animism, encompassing the beliefs that all material phenomena have agency and that perceive things actively solicit our attention or call our focus, was his dominant poetic principle and remained actively so right throughout his career as part of a story-based cosmology in which matter is alive and in possession of a distinct spiritual essence. Animism, rather than empathy with humans, was Hughes's decided attributes, and it was one that shocked his poetry into forcible attention. At a time when British poetry was downsizing into constriction, Hughes arrived with the apparent spirit command of a shaman to emanate his belief that sentience exists not only in humans, but in all the components of nature as a holistic organism. In Beech Tree from Recklings, he again identifies the tree as independent of passive in our direct experience. Quote, And like an old moss hunter, sucking the bones of all speculation, on its leashes fly owls and astronomers' skulls. This pantheistic accrediting of matured awareness instructing the tree is a very different operation to describing its natural characteristic common to left-brained poets, who I hate, with only limited access to the right. It's this facility gives Hughes an almost tribally savage authority over an animalistic domain of lawlessness that shakes all safe boundaries within which most popular poetry is contained. It seems to me, hmm, me, that despite the catastrophic turbulence of his personal life, Hughes's real greatness of unparalleled originality as a poet is most specifically timelined from the publication of his first book, The Hawk and the Rain, 1957, to the seminally warlord avatar Crow 1970, a period in which Hughes's creatively manipulated and often terrifying self-mythology into recognition with the external world. The psychic commerce entailed in this often destabilizing process of poetic authority that may, in happening, override every other principle in life, cost lives in Hughes's case, before more fully reintegrating as a person from the descent into psychological chaos. What we may call an apprenticeship in darkness is often the first stage of a poet's emergence, and how deep he or she is prepared to go as a traveller in counting automatisms, archaic ideation, and transpersonal forms is dependent on individual sensibility. We could additionally argue that poetry, in the way Hughes literally embodies it, that's the only way it embodies it, is a recuperation from deep psychic processes experienced in the archetypal underworld, reinterpreted through the autonomous organization of language, the moody aloneness of the self-harming teenager, avoiding both parents and friends, may be indicative of the first states of poetic rights to a responsive nervous system. Hughes's poem, 
meeting. From his first collection, The Hawk and the Rain, describes something of the initiatory testing of darkness involved in the fragile boundaries between madness and poetry with altogether shocking clarity in their allegorised meeting. You can't get closer to the symbiosis of the engagement of shaman and imaginative realisation than the black goat on a mountain ledge opposing the poet in his menacing pathway towards transforming realities. The black goat looks, stares the adventurer down into a shocked halt that he is in fact being scrutinised by a warning double, quoting Ted, a square, pupiled, yellow-eyed look. The black devil head against the blue air, what gigantic fingers took him up and on a bare palm turned him close under an eye that was like a living, hanging hemisphere and watched his blood gleam with a ray slow and cold and ferocious as a star till the goat clattered away. The poem expresses the return of the primal, the unstoppable rip of raw power retrievably accessible to Hughes at a time of small mapping in British poetry. Put into pop referentials, it's what the Velvet Underground, the Stooges and MC5 were doing as garage prototypes of the period, as the precursors liberating punk into the deconstructive shattering of pop as commodified industry. If Hughes' second collection, Lupercal, finds him most perfectly in command of his core animism, then it's in part because subject and the brain activities involved in creating it often form a corresponding interface in describing the function of a tree-roosting hawk in the stripped-down brilliance of hawk-roosting, Hughes is also deliberating on his method, so poet and bird occupy the same shared space. Quote, I sit in the top of the wood, my eyes closed. In action, no falsifying dream between my hooked head and hooked feet, or in sleep rehearse perfect kills and eats. One closes one's eyes in order to go deeper into psychic space when writing, and the measured inaction or state of quasi-trance often perhaps helps mine the associative state between emergent imageries in the way that a hawk's resting point increases, increases its alertness to kill. In this way, the shaping idea enters the awareness of both poet and bird as the closest core we can get to understanding the relationship between language and existence. Hughes expresses the quality of these convergent states when discussing Shakespeare's conversion of apprehension into spontaneous activity as, quote, he raises the idea into quasi-physical reality, then lets his feeling respond to it exactly as if it were real. That observation alone coming from deep contemplative introspection about the neuro processes involved in framing poetry says everything about Shakespeare that we need ever know. That one line tells you everything. It's that simple if you have the facility, whether you're drunk, ruined, drugged, hopeless, it's always there and accessible to process. In the way of Hughes, Shakespeare wrote oblivious to disruption or the irate haranguing of a wife 
demanding the attention he couldn't give. He drank himself blind and probably didn't bother with his dinner, eating it rapidly when left alone. Anyhow, he preferred boys. <laughs> Sorry for the humour. <laughs> what Hughes accentuates in Lupercal is the centralised position of the poet in the poem. He is direct centre rather than peripheral in the case of more objective poets dissociated from the work and essentially detached into description. In the same way a lot of singers fail convincingly to enter the song, their phrasing suggesting lack of emotional contact with the lyrics and vocal technique as a substitute. Hughes, on the contrary, aha, gets under the skin of his subject like taking it captive and recruiting it for his own. And this isn't necessarily a romantic concept of centralised subjectivity. It's more dominance of liquid empathy empowering the exchange. It's there in many of the great poems that enhance Lupercal as a collection, pipe thrushes and otter hawk rooting November, etc., where Hughes's characteristic dissolve hijacks the intelligence of his subject. And it's the inestimable <sighs> depths of Hughes's mythopoetics allows this to happen. And of the kind he describes fishing a lake for pike as he might his unconscious to connect <sighs> patterns of imagery. Quote, stilled legendary depths. It was as deep as England. It held pike too immense to stir. So immense and old that past nightfall I dared not cast but silently cast them fished with the hair frozen on my head. For what might move, move, move. For what I might move the still splashes on the dark ponds, owls hushing the floating woods, frail on my ear against the dream darkness beneath night's darkness had freed that rose mm, slowly towards me, watching, watching, watching. When you're down that deep into things, it's like the premonition of madness. Once on the edge of a precipitant breakdown, I recall looking out at tall sunflowers in the garden that turned into malevolent, red-faced giants, all synchronistically turned on me with their threat and simultaneously feeling collapsed into interior depths that swallowed me. Hughes's output was monumental and that he never deviated from the inexorable call of poetry as romantic totality. At a time when most poets were systemised into conventional employment, placing the material safety of a career above the hazardous but thrillingly adventurous quest of making poetry a singular command. And if you've really got it bad, and I mean poetry, is a naggingly aggressive addiction. You can't get off because the compromise kills. Part of Sylvia Plath's encyclopedic list of complaints about Hughes, documented in her regular self-therapeutic letters to Dr. Boucher, her one-time psychiatrist, was Hughes's impracticality. Quote Sylvia, he has never paid a bill, always always duck, duck, down. louses up the checkbooks at the times I've asked him to take that over so I'll have to make it right and there's no idea of yearly rates, taxes, bills and of course the answer is why should he when his dominant engagement with poetry was like being sucked into a parallel existence and his sexual motivations those of Dionysian polygamy and throughout her letters and journals, one wonders, as a poet given to hysteric and depressive disorders, Plath should expect Hughes of all people 
to subscribe to Norm. Who cares a fuck about bills when you have poetry to write that is pushing its boundaries out into the cosmos? Anyone living with Hughes's propulsive, monomaniacal drive towards creativity would have been living in the shadow of a mountain, and it's indicative the plus speed rush of agonizingly confessional and celebratory poems that constitute Ariel were written alone at Cork Green Devon in the late summer and autumn of 1962 when Hughes had separated from her and was living with Asia in London. Plus, voluble, unilateral diatribe of hatred directed against Hughes in her letters, another sort of raw power, displays a complete lack of self-reflection on her part as to her hysterical behaviour, behavioural input into marital implosion. Raw power again. Hughes's personification of the primal turbo of a jaguar's black predatory muscle is better caught in Second Lance at a Jaguar in Wadwo, 1967, as a ferociously insightful advance on his first instinctual autopsy of a Jaguar in Hawk in the Rain. It's evidence again of Hughes's ability to become subject rather than poet in the course of operatively writing with the incisive precision of a neurosurgeon stroke. At every stride, he has to turn a corner in himself and correct it. His head is like the worn-down stump of another whole jaguar. His body is just the engine shoving it forwards, lifting the air up and shoving on under, the weight of his fangs hanging the mouth open, bottom jaw combing the ground. The phenomenology of Hughes's transpersonal experiences in poetry are so profoundly reorganising and empathising with alternate states of consciousness that he opens up possibilities of how sentient creatures experience awareness of a world they share with us despite separation. This faculty is so individual to him that it provides an indefensible weaponry of poetic assault, but accented in his first decade of writing when his focus correlated with creatures rather than people, some of them closely observed when Hughes was working as a night watchman at Regent's Park Zoo, and others drawn from his rural upbringing in Miss Morrell, South Yorkshire. It was, of course, this phenomenal centre the tribal that took Hughes to live at North Taunton for the last three decades of life, to root with the mythopoetic and reopen negotiations with what Hughes conceived as the innate power of animistic myths as the resources of his poetry. If his work doesn't appear to expand, but only deepen, it's because Hughes was essentially an underworld journeyer, prepared to encounter and learn from the darkest irrational motives archetypally programmed into the psyche. Reading a Hughes poem can be a bit like confronting a psycho on the tube who is already fixed on you, his murderously psychotic intentions given expression by his rolling eyes. I experienced that once on the Piccadilly line and quickly exiting at Leicester Square against my antagonist's medicated impediment of speed jumped straight into a yellow-lit taxi welcomely stalled at a red light outside the station exit. With Hughes, one has the barrier of words, but the implied impulse of much of Crow manifests the same sort of psychopathologies. In his Shakespeare and the Goddess, arguably the greatest book ever written on poetry, Hughes importantly refers to madness as a, quote, as a new bottomless resource. And for Shakespeare, quote, 
an infinite new field of operations, confirming my own lifelong conviction that the sort of poetry that breaks down doors into new dimensions is of necessity infected by a modified madness, a pinching out of recognisable frontiers into the previously undiscovered. Hughes wrote opposite the contemporary's condition to affirm what is already there, who wants it, what I call the careerist mode, to smack the reader hard in what they promised he always feared to know. And that's one purpose of poetry, the exploration of high weirdness, like journeying into tomorrow and coming out today. I'm interested in what writers do while writing and the processes of adrenalised clarity, maintained or distractive while constructing work. If I'm at home, I listen to rock music. It's stimulating, additive to my inspired work bang. If I'm out, I talk to weirdos in cafes who fixate on my handwriting. But what did Ted do? Drink and drink and drink and walk out in a blaze across farmland, cursing everything under a grey, lowering sky, or shamanically packed through the agencies he recognised as spirit guides. According to Asia Wevel, whose detailed observations of Hughes, documented in black ink in her diary, less maliciously abrasive than class ripping assault in letters, the left-hand side of Hughes's face looked younger than the right, and she saw him in the asymmetrical constituents of at least four different men. She noted, quote, his mouth is grim, it's a sand ditch, and that the saturation of his black moods, black moods, when he sometimes couldn't write, provoked immediate destruction and a total irresponsiveness in him, supported by an exemption from her needs and inquiries as, quote, I'm done, as a way of shutting down. It's back to Iggy Pop's, quote, I am the world's forgotten boy, the one who searches and destroys. Asia also noted the wild demonic Hysteria in Hughes's dream topography of encounters with Plus, and how in one dream her hair had turned white, and that he shot a cat they had in Boston, but it refused to die. In another disturbing dream encounter with Plus, he recorded he had quote a terrible grief dream about Sylvia, long and unending, in a house large stone. On the moor's edge, the garden was also a cemetery. Unquote. It was with this churning, oneric subtext of submerged guilt that Hughes began intimately writing the ferocious butchery of Crow as a questing assault on man's undecidable place in the universe, while claiming that Crow's evolution, quote, gradually develops some purpose in life which becomes a quest to find who created him. Hughes also noted the ambivalent characteristic that, quote, he's forever, through one clue and another, approaching his creator. And when he gets there, it always turns out that it's some female or other. If Crow reads like a series of psychic genocides fired by atavistic mythologies, then it also finds its counterpoint in the serial atrocities of modern warfare as its physical basics. The night before his marriage to Plath, Hughes dreamt that he hooked a huge pike, and when the fish began to surface, its head filled the entire lake. In the same way, we can read his later personification of Crow as a black sun eclipsing the universe. A maniacal aggressor dragged out of primal domain to execute final vengeance like nuclear meltdown. But before Crow, there was Wodwo, 1967. Drawn variously from poetry, written during the time he spent with Clarks, 
the Chalcot Square in 63, <coughs> and much of it during sojourns at Cork Green, when ostensibly Hughes was supporting himself by writing for children, as well as the need to write plays and stories for BBC broadcasts as an essential form of income. The poems in Wadwo, and in particular the superbly elusive title poem, deepened Hughes' myth-making and myth-mapping into nature being fully aware both of its cooperation in and independence of man's efforts. What woe is an invisible entity is drawn to the river searching for a reflective identity rather than being pure consciousness in quasi-mythological suspension. Again, Hughes's shamanic inventiveness goes beyond his contemporaries into a self-definitive Hughes land that permits no trespasses. Quote from what woe, what am I? Nosing here, turning leaves over, following a faint stain on the air to the river's edge, I Enter water. What am I to split the glassy grain of water? Looking upward, I see the bed of the river above me, upside down, very clear. What am I doing here in mid air? Imagination doesn't require answers, it's an extended permeable totality that you can pinch into a chewing gum stretch, whereas formal left brain poets demand that poems resolve into meaning. A meaning of what? Certainly nothing that interests me. Imagination is without resolution, and your own contact with it allows you to reinvent and personalise the experience rather than contriving a factual stoppage like a blocked artery i.e. Larkin. You can sense I hate that man and all of his followers, motion and all that trash. Like all totally committed poets, financial anxiety was a constant, and often plus and after plus suicide, and never really having wanted children, he found his responsibilities as a parent extending to Nicholas, Frieda and Shura the child he had with Asia in March 1965 without ever overtly claiming fatherhood. And how are essentially right brain of poets expected to exist as a particular exacting, inexorably addictive call when left brainers desert poetry for the material safety of secondary jobs. In other words, conceding to normal children the mortgage and the deployment of an institutionalised work ethic. How lucky I am I haven't. It's not without significance that Asia gifted Hughes in December 1966 with the rare 1880 edition of Alexander Gilchrist's seminal Life of William Blake and with the OUP edition of Valor or the Four Zoas in which Blake established his own uniquely disruptive mythology of apocalyptically conflicting cosmogenics without apologies or explanations of his invented symbolism. You can't, with or without them, enter into other people's lives or relationships or judge intrinsic values from an external position that there's something so maliciously venomous about class rebound that you find neither in or Asia. Quote from Asia, I laugh in my guts when I think of them married. They look exactly alike, the same colour, shape, everything. She is his twin sister, and like his sister, barren, uncreative, a real vamp. All sophistication. They smoke... Ted, a non-smoker, has been de- desperately practising. <clears throat> Can't read that of the opposite sex to titillate each other. They will be elaborately unfaithful to each other, very rich and have no children. If her two abortions and four miscarriages 
can let me have this, this satisfaction. To Plath, Asia was, quote, a barrency ad agency writer who commands a huge salary and puts it all on her back. Hmm. There's something of a bit of paradox in all of this and that Plath's published correspondence and journals amount to 4,000 pages, downsizing her poetic output to disproportionately minimal, no matter the incontrovertible brilliance of the aerial poems. Hughes worked a lot harder at poetry, and what woe, despite sharing poems with short stories in a radio play, is a major distillation of his irrepressibly renewable talent. Wardrobe arrives inimitable successes like Thistles, Cadenza, Second Last of the Jaguar, Skylarks, You Drive in a Circle, Peabrock, Full Moon and Little Frida, and not least the title poem, What Woe. Of all these poems, of all these poems succeed in evincing that poetry is the means of experience as well as being the experience itself and that the natural dimensionality of poetry is to introduce the reader to an unfamiliar state of consciousness. My favourite from Wadwo is Cadenza, a turbulent mini-cyclone of imagery fueled to shattering. The poem's unstoppable momentum is experienced like a pilot ditching the nose cone into a mountain face. Quote, the clouds are full of surgery and collision, but the coffin escapes as a black diamond, a ruby brimming blood and emerald beating its shores. The sea lifts swallows wings and flings a summer lake open, spins and bewilders its reflection till the whole sky dives shut like a burned land back to its spark. <laughs> Nobody else could have written that. This is Hughes' raw power, raw power, ramped up to optimal with ravagingly lapidary imagery, brimming with colours bled from source, and its audiovisual too with an emerald beating its shores, as though a green ocean is contained in the stone. What woe, as a transitional collection, rewards with a searing, shape-shifting originality in which the roughage of Hughes's Saxon diction rounds into sensuality, arcs into a sweep and hints at the emergent themes of Crow in which, abandoning all artifice, Hughes sets about disemboweling his own poems with his bare hands. Who can forget thistles in their continuously undefeatable resurgence? Quote, everyone a revengeful burst of resurrection. A class fistful of splintered weapons and Icelandic frost thrust up from the underground stain of a decayed Viking. Raw power in Hughes's timeline. And I'm also thinking of Black Sabbath's iconic heavy metal album Paranoid from 1970, a record signature by Tony Lamy's aviational guitar riffs, drilling existence back a mile with every chord. At the same time as Hughes is publishing his enduring children's book, The Iron Man, so too Black Sabbaths recorded their own Iron Man, a slice of apocalyptic time travel in which the voyager, in the process of returning to the present, is turned into steel by a magnetic field and unable to communicate his findings, turns on humanity with catastrophic vengeance. It's definitely Hughes' territory, even though, though it's improbable there's any overlap or that either artist was aware of the other's similar quest. While it's the guitar riff goes sonically stratospheric and aggressive incremental firepower, the lyric exploring the dumb state of a psycho is leaning towards similar in Crow. Quote, 
Has he lost his mind? Can he see or is he blind? Can he walk at all? Or if he moves, will he fall? Is he alive or dead? It is an amazing phenomenon that both Hughes and Plath seem to have been totally blocked to the existence of rock music as the most influentially generational vector of times they lived through, with Hughes's preference always remaining classical and missing out on the shamanic components of the rock hero as tribal apotheosis and the liberating dynamic of sexualized energies it emitted. For Asia, not too long to go, for Asia, accompanying Hughes on his psychic pathway into Crow, she was forced to live with Hughes's parents at Cork Green, both of whom refused to acknowledge or speak to her. And in a household redolent of class, and in Asia's words, quote, a strong sensation of her repugnant live presence alienated and excluded by Hughes's locked for hours in his writing hut and emerging like re-entry from the dissociative pull of inner space, she began to contemplate suicide with the underlying belief that Hughes would never support class suicide and that she was in part to blame. In 1967, Asia returned to live and work in London moving into a flat 14 at Marlborough Place, St John's Wood, and working for the Ogilvy Agency, while Hughes's poetic strain was persistently disrupted by looking after his chronically ill mother and equally depressed father. Returning to Cork Green in 1968, her sense of humiliation and despair tunnelled Induce the Hughes's inflexible routines and dislike of any attempted rearrangement to the layout of his house, and in addition, she had been fired from her agency job. Again, separating geographically from Hughes, Asia took over the lease of a flat in Oakover Manor in the north side of Clapham Common, while Hughes at Cork Green forced an entry into the incohate darknesses of the epic he conceived as Crow, originally intended to incorporate prose and poetry as a monumental construct he never satisfactorily succeeded in completing. Even when Crow was published in 1970, the book omitted a wide scattering of Crow's poems already published in limited editions and in magazines and seemingly discarded. What is Crow? The partially conceived epic that Hughes identified as his poetic legacy? Is it a black avatar of butchered self-loathing in which the artophardic poet cannibalizes his own experiences in the making of the poem into nihilistic degradation? Is it the internalized representation of Hughes into predatory sexual trickster accounting for suicides at the cost of his using bodies like meat? Is it the demythicization of religio myth into its opposite, the existential nadir? Is it the demolition of his own earlier writing mythologies into an apparent nuclear fallout of metaphor, a surreal catastrophe? Is it a black hex in which the incantations pull short of the feature? Is it end times germinated by a psychotic database? Is it the deliberation of millennia finally realised as brain-bashing atrocity, the sum of everything we imagine about the barbarity of the past and the nuclear warheads of the future? Is it an insertion into the primordial intelligence of creatures raided by Hughes and translated into the present? There aren't any answers to visionary poetics. Only that the poem's manic assault succeeds in smashing the lock in generation through the front teeth. If what was indicative of Hughes's expansive experimentation, then Crow was his delivery. 
The annihilative poetry is so independent in its operation that it owes nothing to the British underground or to the American postmodernism spearhead by John Ashbury as the liberating movements of the period. It so adamantly, obstinately hues, both in its conception and in its piling on of remorseless violence, that the power of the writing exceeds its boundaries, like, quote, the man smashing everything he could reach and had strength to smash before he went beyond his own body, unquote. That may have been Hughes's ugly, compulsive mood at the time of writing an intended epic that is like a black litany to death as an active rather than passive state. In support of his personalised black beast as indestructible avenger, Hughes's argument extends to creation as a conjectural sick joke. In the poem A Horrible Religious Error, the emergent serpent of biblical myth and the embodiment of evil terrifies all creation except Crow. Quote, but Crow only peered and took a step or two forward, grabbed this creature by the slack skin nate, beat the hell out of it and ate it. Steeped in folklore, alchemy, shamanism and the occult, Hughes, by way of exposition of his black trickster, conceded, quote, Crow is another word for the entrails, lungs, heart, etc., everything extracted from a beast when it is gutted. What is extracted when this is done is the vital organism of the creature, lacking only the brain and nerves. The crow of a man, in other words, is the essential man, only minus his human-looking vehicle, his bones and muscles, unquote. However one aspects Crow, the poem's impacting velocity continues to tear into the fabric of the future. Whatever its constituents of eviscerated myths bled into the tech of modern genocides and oligarchical autocracies, Crow remains the supreme documentation of the defiantly triumphant anti-hero in an arena in which, quote, reality was given its lesson, its mishmash of scripture and physics, with here brains in hands, for example, and there legs in treetops. Hughes wrote Crow against the menacing undertow of parallel relationships conflicting with his equivocal commitment to Asia, whose inner resources to a part-time affair were starting to run out. Although still provocatively beautiful at 42, Asia had most probably been configuring her suicide as the second enactment of Plus for a long time preparatory to the act. Like Plus, she died in a sealed kitchen the gas taps full on, and according to her neighbour, Miss Jones, who discovered who discovered her lying on some blankets on the floor on her left side, and her daughter was lying on her back, with her face inclined towards her mother. Hughes, who was a cold green, was the next day summoned by police knocking on his door to report immediately to Southwark Mortuary, London. The police were led to him by Asia, having left a stamped envelope addressed to him on her bedside table to identify the two bodies. In her will, Asia left Hill, left Hughes, quote, My no doubt welcome accent and my always bitter contempt. Smashed, disconsolate, and with his life again in personal ruin, Hughes abandoned work on his heroically imagined epic and published Crow the following year in 1970 as a fractured portion of the intended whole. He told Brenda Hedden that he needed to admit his obsessive saturation with the words death and black as an unmitigating mantra repeatedly scorch-invoked in Crow from future works 
and move on into another attempted reintegration. How and where you deposit grief is an entirely personal issue and poetry does little or nothing to repair it. Rather, it pushes you back into it rather than out. Hughes kept his grief private, his psychological scars submerged, not publishing birthday letters, his poems addressed the plus until the year of his death, 1998, and choosing to publish his poems for Assia Capriccio as a limited edition from the Gehenna Press in 1990. And my own life, the suicides of friends started very early, either from the unmanageability of life's demands, drug abuse and dependencies, or the despair that comes of depressed disorders. I've written deeply personal elegies for most of the dead in my life, and of course the experience of the poem is unshared by the recipient. At best, it's a token for the family or friends as beneficiaries, and of course it costs pain, retrieving what you do from associated memories and attempting to compress the salient characteristics of a person into words that fit with aspects of their personality. It's invariably a flawed remake a scattered offering. Nobody knows what I do at the living room other than they express wonder at the consistency of my handwriting and how could I tell them the unlocatable zones of inner space I'm travelling through because I don't know myself. In this case I'm trying to make a small entry point into the gigantic carcass of Ted Hughes's remains, his poetry, or what he called the crow, the essence that outlives the body and continues, in his case, to glow. Thank you. invited Mikey Fitzpatrick to sing a song from his album Crow before we finish there was this man and he was the strongest of the strong he gritted his teeth like a cliff Though his body was swinging away Like a torrent on a cliff Smoking towards dark gorges There he nailed himself With nails of nothing All the women of the world could not move him. They came, their mouths deformed against stone. They came and their tears salted his nail holes, only adding their embitterment to his effort. He abandoned his grin to them, his grimace. With his face upward body, he lay face downwards, as a dead man adamant. His sandals would not move him. They burst their thongs and rotted from his fixture. All the men of the world could not move him. They wore at him with their shadows and little sounds. Their arguments were a relief Like heather flowers His belt would not endure the siege It burst And lay broken He grinned Little children came in chorus to move him But he glanced at them 
Out of his eye corners, over the edge of his grin, they lost their courage for life. Oak forests came and went with the hawk wind. Mountains rose and fell. He lay crucified on all the earth, and he grinned through the strings of his lips and the bones of his teeth. In his senseless trial of strength, in his senseless trial of strength. In his senseless trial of strength, in his senseless trial of strength. You can, before Grandma gets the clothes, you can ask me any questions you want, right in the not too personal. You can ask me anything about the talk I've just given. If you feel I like think it. we've got time for just Couple. maybe two questions. Okay. Would anyone yeah. like to ask? And I do have to thank Jeremy for one of the most exciting lectures of the evening that he has given us and for the way that he channeled the energy of Hughes. Very fully, very inspiring. Do we have any questions? For Jeremy. Um, yeah. Do you remember discussing uh, Ted Hughes with Kathleen Rain at all? I do immensely, yeah. yeah. Kathleen always claimed Ted couldn't write about people, but wrote brilliantly about nature. And therefore she kind of downgraded him into not a great poet because she felt he didn't empathise with humans. Yeah. Um, but she had respect, of course, for the way he looked at nature. I helped convince her that he was absolutely fantastic. Um, but later in life, yeah, she, she saw it, but the ferocity and the violence perhaps made her feel a little yeah. bit uncomfortable um, because she saw nature mystically, he saw a true nature, and I think that was their slight, slight difference. But she loved his book, Shakespeare and the Goddess. She bought me a copy as soon as it came out and said to me, read it. It's the best book on poetry ever written. And it simply is. If, anybody, if you want to know how poetry is written, read Ted Hughes's Shakespeare and the Great Goddess of Being. Nobody has ever come closer to the nerves of what it creates to write. Thank you very much, thank Chris. Anybody like to ask a last question? Maybe that's the moment to conclude. I think you've, you've said it all. Yeah, you could. You know, I'm a proponent only of the imaginative and anti the careerist, which is 99% of poets. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you, Michael. Thank, thank, thank you, everybody. you. Um, And do, do engage in conversation, but not for too long. Yes. <laughs> thank we, you. We so can talk on our way.